here we are on Epiphany Sunday. For our neighbors in the Eastern Orthodox Church, today is actually their Christmas Eve, and so let us all wish them glad tidings and hope that their days are merry and bright. But for us, all the presents are unwrapped, all the eggs have been gnawed, all the carols have been sung, and we have feasted and feted our way through the 12 days of Christmas. It's time to put away the ornaments and the holiday playlists for yet another year. Today is Epiphany Sunday, and as we talked about in children's time, this is the day that we celebrate the arrival of the three magi, those astrologers and wise men who undertook a long pilgrimage to pay homage to their tiny king sleeping in a manger. Inevitably, my Facebook feed is filled with wise men humor this week. Jokes like this oldie but goodie. What would have happened if it had been three wise women instead of three wise men who came to the manger? Well, the three wise women would have asked for directions, arrived on time, helped to deliver the baby, cleaned up the stable, offered practical gifts, and of course, like every good United Church woman, have brought a casserole. These days, it seems like the three wise men get shortchanged. When they're not the butt of jokes, we treat them like an afterthought. They miss out on all the joy and wonder of the night of Jesus' birth. Even their most famous song, We Three Kings, didn't make it into our Voices United hymnal. And technically, they're not even part of the Christmas story because we celebrate their arrival after the season of Christmas. And we even celebrate it in a different calendar year. It's like the wise men have come late to the office Christmas party, and they found that the band has already packed up, and all that is left to eat are a few chips and maybe some ominous-looking fruitcake. I mean, what's the point, really, of having them show up at all? Moreover, today's astronomers like to rain on the wise men's parade, too. They look at all the astronomical phenomena that we know about, like comets and supernova, and they say, we have no idea what this big bright star the wise men were actually following was. And they say, as far as we can tell, there was no bright astronomical feature in the sky that occurred around the time of Jesus' birth, give or take a few years. Like, you know, there's this wide window and nothing really happened that much in the sky. Furthermore, there is no record of that star appearing anywhere outside of Christian literature. So what they're saying is that our current understanding of science can't corroborate the presence of the Christmas star. And all the other sky watchers of that time, from the Romans to the Egyptians, nobody else noticed a big bright star in the sky. They definitely didn't see anything significant enough to mention in their records. So there's a big question mark beside the story of the three wise men. Did it even happen at all? And is it even worth celebrating the Magi's arrival on this day of Epiphany, almost two weeks after the big event of Christmas? But we as United Folk, Church Folk, do celebrate it. And not just today on Epiphany Sunday, but throughout the entire season of Epiphany, which starts today and spans all the way till Lent, which is in March this year. So for us, Epiphany is a big deal. And as I've continued through my studies, I've realized that for me, Epiphany is almost as big a deal as Easter. At Easter time, we celebrate that ours is a God of miracles, a God of new beginnings, a God whose love for us never ends. During Epiphany, it's our time to return the favor. It's our time to acknowledge who God is to us. When the shepherds visited Jesus, they did so because the angel told them to. Our scriptures say that they were terrified by the appearance of these heavenly messengers. It's easy to presume that when they went to visit Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, it was as much out of curiosity and adoration as it was out of fear. The wise men, on the other hand, they intentionally came to the manger. Their interpretation of the stars and of scripture told them that a king had been born. And not just any king, but someone extraordinary. Someone special enough to warrant their journeying for weeks, if not months, on end. The word epiphany means to reveal. 
What we're celebrating today is how God revealed God's self through and within Jesus. That those who encounter Jesus and those who looked with eyes to see, they experienced the presence of God while they were with him. God was made manifest and revealed in the very humble person of Jesus. In the Christmas story, the wise men represent us regular folk. They're the only ones in the nativity narrative who were not explicitly told by angels what was going on. They determined what was happening for themselves, and they chose to bring their most precious gifts as an offering to the new king. And God was with them as they journeyed, leading them through their dreams and intuition. What we are being invited to do today as Christians is a very similar thing to identify Jesus as our Messiah and Blessed One, and to offer the very best of what we have, our lives and our very selves, in service to him. This is what I meant when I said earlier that Epiphany is our time to acknowledge God, who God is to us. Yes, Epiphany literally means God's revelation to humankind, but we have a role to play here too. Epiphany is just as much about our response, our acknowledgement, and our declaration that we are proudly Christian and that we cherish and honor the magnificent person of Jesus who came to show us the way. You may notice over the next two months that throughout the entire season of Epiphany, our lectionary readings are filled with stories of Jesus' life and teachings. This is a time when we get loud and proud about being Jesus people. This is a time that we revel in being disciples of Christ and we remember Jesus' ministry. We have an opportunity at this time of year to refresh our memories of who Jesus was and what he stood for and how love and justice were central to his teaching. If Easter is the time that God claims us as his beloved children, then Epiphany is the time that we claim God right back by declaring our love for Jesus, his son. Epiphany is not only the time that God reveals himself to us through Jesus, but it is also when we respond and reveal our love and allegiance to God. And this is why, in my way of thinking, Epiphany is just as important as Easter. For as marvelous and life-giving as it is that God, through Jesus, has shown us the way of love and reconciliation, it all matters not unless we embrace that way. When you hear the carol, We Three Kings, you may notice that the second last verse links the time of Epiphany to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and in case you don't remember that particular verse, I'll sing it for you. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, soaring, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in a stone-cold tomb. John Henry Hopkins, Jr., an Episcopal minister from Pennsylvania, he's the one who wrote that carol, We Three Kings, in 1857. And he knew that you can't have one without the other. Epiphany and Easter are intrinsically linked. Although we have a liturgical calendar and there are various Christian seasons throughout the year, we are always being called to be Easter people and to be Epiphany people. We are always being challenged to center God more fully in our lives and to follow Jesus' way of love and service. So I'd like to invite you to open your Voices United hymn book if you've got one at home. Um, just open it up and take a look at number 80. Number 80. It's a short epiphany prayer. And I love prayers and poems like this that are just packed to the gills with meaning and mystery and that are really pithy and they get to the point. So I think there's a lot here that this, this prayer has to say. So if you've got it before you, let's read it together. O God, our light, our beauty, our rest, with the appearance of your Son, you have brought us into your new creation. Form us into your people and order our lives in you through Christ, the living one. Amen. You'll notice that this prayer captures the theme of the Epiphany season where it says, Form us into your people and order our lives in you through Christ. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. 
That's what we're being called to do. And I really like the imagery of the first line. So, oh God, our loving, amazing God, whom Jesus called Abba, you are our light. Like the star of the Magi, you are our beacon, our lighthouse, and our sun. You shine so brightly that darkness and despair are soon forgotten. You fill us to the brim with goodness. God, you are our beauty. All that is good, all that is new, all that is reborn arises from you. Your creative, loving impulse reveals the strength, beauty, and grace of everything. Oh God, you are our rest. When we trust in you, and we trust in the seeds of goodness and transformation that you sow in our lives, then we can stop worrying about things. We can stop overthinking and overplanning and overdoing, and we can just be. We can truly rest in you, O oh loving God. So let us again read those words together, but much more slowly. Let's allow these words to really sink in and challenge us. Let us pray. O oh God, our light, our beauty, our rest. With the appearance of your Son, you have brought us into new creation. Form us into your people and order our lives in you through Christ, the living one. Amen. My friends, arise, shine, for your light is come. May the season of Epiphany fill you with great joy and great purpose. Amen and blessings.